presentation today is on the intervention of transmission of trauma in Holocaust survivor families. And as already been mentioned, there is a great deal of psychological literature in this area, which primarily investigates post-traumatic stress symptoms in the children of survivors that come from a variety of areas, uh, family being one, mass media being others, and films and other ways in which survivors, their children, their grandchildren learn about their own experiences and the experiences of others. The focus of my paper today is a little bit different. It's on the role that survivor narratives, or what's often called Holocaust storytelling, play in the identity formation among descendants of the Holocaust. Within this field of study, I'm particularly interested in the role that family narratives play in the tra transmission of trauma from mothers to daughters and to granddaughters. This research is part of a larger project, but a lot of what I'll be describing today is based on a qualitative study of 40 women descendants, 33 daughters and seven granddaughters of Holocaust survivors. Participants for this study range in age from 23 to 60. They're drawn primarily from the United States, though a number of participants are from other countries, including Israel, Slovakia, and Romania. Participants for this study were recruited primarily through children of survivor organizations, of which there are many in the United States, and also from referrals from other descendants. All of the interviews I conducted were under conditions of confidentiality, hence I do not have any visual aids today. Using a semi-structured interview format, participants were asked a series of open-ended questions about growing up in a survivor family and the means by which Holocaust memories and experiences were conveyed to succeeding generations. In almost all cases, the participants report that Holocaust storytelling began in the descendant's childhood. In later years, these stories were often revised with new narratives added as the survivors aged. In many families, the stories were ongoing and frequently repeated as the following, following account of a 60-year-old daughter reveals. My mother's stories played over and over in my mind. Sometimes she would recount the same stories, adding details as she remembered them. It always gripped me as she spoke in a sad and tearful voice. She would say, I have to tell you, was how her stories often started. The listening sessions were not held on any regular basis, but occurred sporadically over a 15-year period. So I must have been six or seven when they began. The stories were realistically painted gave me the sense that I was living through them. As this and other accounts reveal, the stories that shape the descendant's understanding of a horrific past are often conveyed through imagery and detail that are both gripping and terrifying. In this respect, descendant generations, often at young ages, are given knowledge that lays bare the harshest and most cruel realities of war and genocide creating both the fascination with the past and a sense of overwhelming emotion. The findings thus reveal that the intergenerational transmission of trauma impacts descendant identity formation in two important ways. The first is through an identification with victimhood and suffering, and the second is through an identification with heroism and moral agency. Turning first to the findings on victimized identity, Respondents reported that with the intimacy of family life, the lines between past and present were often blurred as the memory of atrocities traveled across time and space from Nazi Europe to the culture and consciousness of the post-Holocaust household. Here, a daughter in the, her 50s recalled with great detail the story that her mother frequently recounted of her arrival in Auschwitz. One of the saddest stories my mother told me was her initial arrival at Auschwitz. On the first day, she and her mother were forcibly separated, never to see each other again. Younger children were taken from their mothers, and elderly women were ordered to stand with young mothers, 
holding their crying babies. She said, we pretended we didn't know why we were being separated, but we put two and two together. The elderly, feeble, young mothers and babies and young children grouped together to be killed. My heart was torn out to see my mother in that room, and I was never the same after that. My mother always emphasized the word never, and she would have a faraway look in her eyes when she spoke. Further, it is significant to know that for many of the women survivors, the atrocity narratives they shared with their daughters focused on fears surrounding rape and violence against women and girls. Another daughter offers this insight into these gender themes. The story that horrified me most was, as a young girl, was my mother's description of filing past the barbs, suffering the looks, smirks, and comments exchanged among the Nazi soldiers. Because Yiddish and German are similar languages, mother understood what was being said. She said, I cowered and stooped as I walked past the bars. I tried to make myself unattractive so I wouldn't be chosen for pleasure. She had said that she noticed that a few of the prettier women had been singled out and they would just disappear. Other narratives recounted with great pain and sorrow the witnessing of rape during massacres and mass executions. The last image of a mother or sister that of sexual violation before death. It was therefore not uncommon for daughters to imagine themselves as rape victims, replacing the survivor in the Holocaust narrative. This traumatic form of identification illuminates the power of atrocity narratives to create a context through which confusion between self and other becomes possible if not inevitable. Marianne Hirsch describes this phenomenon as a form of post-memory. She writes that to grow up with overwhelming inherited memories is to be dominated by narratives that preceded one's birth or one's consciousness. It's to risk having one's own stories and experiences displaced, even evacuated by those of a previous generation. As Hirsch maintains, inherited memories that are transmitted through family narratives provide content for both conscious and unconscious expressions of Holocaust victimhood, particularly among descendants whose dreams and fantasies place them in the traumatic landscape of a mother's past. A 50-year-old daughter explains, my mother would talk about living in the barracks and makeshift soap, what they wore, how cold it was in Poland in those night shirts, and other things. I remember being five years old thinking, you shouldn't be telling me this, I'm a little kid. And then you start to imagine. You think the worst case scenarios, and your fantasy life starts to go hog wild. And it's your mother, and it's you too, and we are all there together. As the above account suggests, dreams and fantasies provide a space of imagined terror where an identification with survivor victimhood is realized through an unconscious self-construction. While daughters were particularly vulnerable to the problems of this identity confusion, atrocity narratives also played a role in the construction of identities of victimhood among granddaughters of survivors. A 28-year-old granddaughter describes her own experience of the ways in which she was impacted by her grandmother's stories. I'm the first grandchild, she told me. My grandmother just always talked to me. We'd be sitting at the table, and she'd talk to me. I know her face, and she'd be tense, and suddenly the story would start. She was a child in the forest. She found a little girl crying, and she just took her. And then they found the little girl's aunt, and she gave the child to her aunt. And she said to me, I don't know if she's still alive. I don't know what happened to this little girl. And then suddenly my grandmother remembered, and she would keep talking. It's like very scattered, but I think it's all the stress of her remembering and telling me. This respondent went on to explain that as a result of her grandmother's shared memories, she began to write her own Holocaust stories as a child. I remember when I was 12 years old, it was a competition to write books. So I wrote about the Holocaust girl, and I got a prize for it. There was this Holocaust girl. She lives under the bridge, and the trains go over the bridge, and she cuts the tracks so the train falls in the water. Everybody dies, 
but the little girl didn't die, of course. Everybody in the train died, but at least the bad people didn't take one. I was the little girl in the story. I was totally into it. Another granddaughter recounted stories about her survival grandparents and the dreams of fear and victimization that haunted her. I remember when I used to go with my grandmother to see her friend, she would tell me the person who was a Holocaust survivor. It was like she would say, be careful, they're survivors. Then I learned in increments about my own family and how they died in the Holocaust. I had many nightmares about this. Until two or three years ago, I can remember just being haunted by human beings, exterminated, looked for, just running away to the Swiss border, trying to pretend that I'm Christian. That's one of the places where the paranoia shows up. I always travel with prayer beads in my backpack, so if anyone asks, it's like, here it is, I'm really Catholic. As this analysis suggests, Atrocity narratives are central to the responding to the reproduction of a victimized identity among descendants. At the same time, however, it is important to point out that narratives of agency and empowerment were also part of the storytelling legacy of post-Holocaust families, conveying messages of fearlessness and moral choice that impacted the identity of children and grandchildren of survivors. Accordingly, the second set of findings focuses on an identification of heroism, moral choice, and acts of agency. As reported by the descendants, stories of Holocaust heroism were often embedded in tra trauma narratives where terror and fear coexisted alongside acts of bravery and courage. For the participants, the heroic narrative held a special place in the telling of the family story with descendants expressing a sense of pride at the courage of a parent or grandparent who resisted and refused to be dehumanized. A 27-year-old granddaughter invoked the courage of her grandmother. These are the stories she liked telling me. My grandmother was a nurse. She learned how to be a nurse. When the Germans came near their village in Poland, she told me they were shooting everyone in the forest, and she and my grandfather ran from the village. They were in the forest, and they had been captured a lot of times. What saved them was that my grandmother was a nurse, and they needed her. It was the Russians who found them. And she told the Russians they had to take my grandfather, too, that he could help in the Russian army. The Russians needed nurses, and this is how she was saved, and she saved my grandfather, too. I've always admired my grandmother and her stories. I would really like to try to be like her. She is the hero of my story, too. Well, this example of a heroic grandmother is in keeping with traditional notions of bravery and action. Other findings suggest a much more complicated interpretation of personal agency, one in which acts of sexual bartering are seen as agentic and empowering by descendants. In this respect, participants describe a range of sexual relationships in which their mothers and grandmothers engaged, including those of other prisoners, Nazi officials, and non-Jews who were in a position to provide protection, resources, and avenues of escape. In sharing these survivor stories, the descendants distinguished between rape and sexual bartering, often quick to point out that such exchanges were among the few options available to their mothers and grandmothers who sought to protect themselves and others from harm. A daughter in her 50s thus described her mother as a role model for using both her wits and her sexuality to survive our Auschwitz. She was only 17. She was beautiful. And I know there is much more to the story than meets the eye. There were hints, more than hints sometimes, that she was somebody's mistress. And she always taught my sister and I that being beautiful to help oneself, looking well-dressed is really important, no matter how poor or in need you are. For this responded to mother's actions offered a model of strength and resourcefulness. Her mother's choice to engage in sexual bartering rather than to starve or die was framed as a source of pride by this descendant, whose own identity was shaped by the types of moral choices her mother was forced to make. Narratives of sexual bartering thus contribute to the construction of a more open and more tolerant moral selfhood among descendants were painfully aware of the tenuous moral landscapes in which their mothers and grandmothers survived. One participant explained, I have information from the stories. 
I heard about what she had to do to save herself and her sisters, and it has made me a different person. Not to judge others if you don't know what they have been through. My grandmother and I and my mother and I are very close, and she is a model for me of a certain type of strength and will to survive. In conclusion, the findings of my research reveal the importance of Holocaust narratives for the construction of the descendant self. As survivors convey their personal histories to their children and grandchildren, the narrative content of their story help to shape the self-concept of the descendants around notions of both victimhood and agency. Further, as the findings show, gender plays a significant role in this dynamic of traumatic transference, highlighting the ways in which gender narratives inform the complicated process of identity formation among daughters and granddaughters of survivors. Thank you.